Welcome to Beyond the Coverage. I'm Chris Horner. This is the Perry Roubaix 2023 post race edition. Now, if you guys are big time cycling fans of the flatter cobblestone classics like I am, this Monday is a little bit of a low for you guys. Hopefully, you had a good Easter dinner yesterday. I know I had a busy day covering 260 plus kilometers of the Men's Perry Roubaix edition and trying to find all those little details to bring to you guys on the butterfly effect. But today, when I sit down on the Chesterfield and I open up the computer, I see the article from Philippe Gerbert. We all know Philippe Gerbert. He's won four of the five classic monuments during his career before he retired, and he's a road world champion. Now he was riding on the back of the motorcycle as one of the commentators for GCN. And when I look at the Cycling News article, he says that Wout Van Aert's flat tire is just not down to bad luck. He thinks it's down to Wout Van Aert being a little too aggressive and a little too excited on the cobblestones. And he compares his years of racing at the Tour de France on the cobblestones when he went a little bit too aggressive and ended up finishing fourth using too much energy. Now that's always a possibility, you can't deny it. Philippe Joubert could be 100% correct, but I like to go with the math figures on this, and I think Wout Van Aert did an exceptional Perry roubaix on yesterday's edition, so I wanna do the math and kind of compare a little bit and put down this Philippe Joubert article and say it's just nonsense, because Wout Van Aert looked absolutely exceptional to me yesterday. Now, when we look at 110 kilometers to go to the finish, We'll see at 110K, this is when Wout Van Aert has that mechanical and has the flat tire and has to change bikes and chases back on. That's already a problem. We go back to last year's edition for Yumbo Visma at Perry Roubaix, and we saw where their wheels were all collapsing and having all kinds of mechanical issues. So keep that in mind, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that's 100% focused on this 23 edition, but it means they have wheel problems in 22, means already at 110 kilometers to go, Wout Van Aert's having flat problems and bike issues where they has to chase to get back on. Then we see what Wout Van Aert blows the race up at sector 20 before we get into the Ironberg Forest at section 19. We see that there's that decisive group up front with Christophe Laporte, Wout Van Aert, John Degen Colt, the past winner of Perry Roubaix, who's found some fabulous form. He's up there for DSM and Matthew Van Der Poel. Those are the big favorites at yesterday's edition of Perry roubaix We go through the forest and when they exit, Christophe Laporte, Yumbo Visma, has a mechanical with a flat tire and has to do a back wheel change. That's two Yumbo Visma major problems with wheel issues here at Perry roubaix Now Matthew Van Der Poel's in that front group still while Van Aert's up there and they both pause and wait for the groups to come back that are chasing from behind. And now Albacine de Kunic have three riders in this front group with Jasper Philipson and Johnny Vermash. That's three riders in the front group as we're coming into the finish here with just under 90 kilometers to go. Now, Matthew Vanderpool put in some great digs as I covered on the butterfly effect yesterday, and those were impressive. But I want to point out, many times he's cutting through the corners, jumping off the cobblestones, riding through the gravel, coming back on the cobblestones where you could easily flat, riding up on the grass edges in the corners to keep his speed through there. Must have had those corners pre-done in some recon days before or remembers them from the years past because to come through those corners and plan that grass edge to be up there where he did is was an amazing tactical advantage there for Matthew Vanderpool when he rides up on the grass and is able to come back onto the cobblestones without crashing and without flatting, which is what I want to focus on. Now we come into 28 kilometers to go, and this is where we see a flat tire from Albacine de Kunic. And I'm guessing here if it's a flat, could just be a mechanical. I spent a lot of time trying to look at the tires to see if Jasper Philipson actually had a front flat or a rear flat, but I couldn't quite tell from the video. If I'm guessing, it could be a front, but remember they're running low air pressure anyways. So maybe he just had a little blurp and he's running tubeless or something. Maybe he's, the air pressure's come down and he wants to change his bike. Maybe it's not a complete flat. Maybe he thinks it was leaking all the way. Maybe it's a complete other bike issue. I'm not certain. But either way, it's a mechanical issue with 28 kilometers to go for Jasper Philipson. So from 110 kilometers all the way up here to 28 kilometers to go, we've seen Wild Van Aert have a mechanical, 
Christophe Laporte has his mechanical coming out of the force, and then he has another mechanical with a flat tire, I assume, later in the race while he was chasing that front group with Nathan Van Hooydunk trying to get up to the group. So that's three issues, bike issues, whether flats or mechanicals, for Jumbo Visma. Now we come into 15 kilometers to go. While Van Aert's leading, he goes through the left turn with a lot of speed with Matthew Vanderpool chasing. We see Matthew Vanderpool ride through this left. He's going to blaze through it, and again, he's going to come off the cobblestone, use the banking and the grass, and then come back onto the cobblestone and start to close the gap up to Wout Van Aert. At this moment, Wout Van Aert knows he's got a flat tire as the back tire slides just a little bit to the left side, coming off the crown of the cobblestone there. Now he moves to the left and off the cobblestones for a smoother ride onto the gravel, and then Matthew Vanderpool's locked onto his wheel behind. Now, this is when things get a little technical here at the race, but we'll see Matthew Vanderpool, what looks like he's getting ready to attack Wout Van Aert. And I believe Wout Van Aert left the gravel in order to slow down that tack from Matthew Vanderpool. Otherwise, I don't see much reason why you'd leave the smooth dirt unless, of course, it was the two spectators that were sticking out just a little bit into the gravel there. So maybe Wout Van Aert worried about that. Or maybe while Van Aert felt the pressure from Matthew Vanderpool getting ready to attack him. And if you got a flat tire and you're on a narrow cobblestone road, you want to be in front of that rider because he can't attack you if he's in front. So I think Walt takes his bike with the flat tire, goes back up onto the crown of the cobblestone in order to slow the attack of Matthew Vanderpool. Now, we all know the outcome after that. Matthew Vanderpool pulls around Wout Van Aert. Wout Van Aert has to slow down to make the right turn off the cobblestone and get that rear wheel flat tire fixed and then Matthew Vanderpool wins the race. Now, let's get back into the stories of why I believe it's not just Matthew Vanderpool riding over the cobblestones and having some amazing technique that uh, somehow he, get, does, he avoids getting a flat tire. Well, you do the simple math, with Yumbo Visma, they had four flat tires or mechanicals between two with Christophe Laporte and two with Wout Van Aert from 110 all the way to the finish there at Perry Roubaix. And you look at Albacine de Kunick, and you look at Matthew Vanderpool, he had no issue. And you guys will say, well, he knows how to handle his bike, Chris. You're just there reaffirming what Philippe Javert said in his article. That's true. He didn't. But Jasper Philipson only had one flat tire. And then, of course, Gianni Vermesh didn't have any flats either. So that's four bike issues compared to one when we're talking about Albacine de Kunick with only one issue and Jumbo Visma with multiple issues. That's why I wanted to bring in the 2022 edition where they had mechanicals in that year with their wheels crashing and stuff too. After a while, when there's a pattern, you know it could be bad luck. It could be bad riding or over-aggressive as Philippe Gerbert stated in his article, but it could just be bad equipment. And I think with Jumbo Visma, we're looking at bad equipment, not over-aggressive riding from Wout Van Aert because Wout Van Aert was something exceptional with his tactics of blowing the race up on Section 20. And then, of course, backing off after he lost Christophe Laporte back there and making Albacine de Kunick do all the work. But that flat again at 15 kilometers to go could be bad luck, but I don't think it's an over-aggressive riding. And I believe it's down to their equipment because years past show they've had bad equipment. This year, when you look at the sheer numbers between Albacine de Kunick and Christophe Laporte, you're talking about Jumbo Visma's Wild Van Aert, Christophe Laporte, two riders with four flats, and you're talking about three riders with only one mechanical or one flat tire for Jasper Philipson. So it's got to be left down to a mechanical issue, just not over-aggressive riding, as Philippe Gerbert states that Wout Van Aert was doing on yesterday's Perry roubaix because I just don't see it and don't agree with it. Now, one more thing before I go, when we're talking about stage six of the Basque Country and all those knuckleheads in that race, when we're talking about those tactics of how Jumbo Visma had backed off, put two guys in the front group of 12, 13 riders up there and were willing to gamble that other teams would chase. And yes, they did with Bahrain Victorious. And yes, I still believe they were knuckleheads. And yes, I believe Jumbo Visma was still knuckleheads to put their faith into other riders to chase or to put their faith in Walter up front there, Walter up front in that group, and of course Stephen Kreiswick up in that front in that group to be able to protect their general classification instead of just riding the team on the front. 
and you only have to look at one race that was done on the exact same day as stage six of the Basque Country. Let's go back over to Perry Roubaix again, but let's go to Perry Roubaix Avec Swift Femme Edition because when we look at that, we see SD Works who are happy to let a almost 20 rider group go up the road with only one SD Works rider in that group. That means they were hoping other teams would chase that didn't make it into that big selection of breakaway riders just as Jumbo Visma did on stage six. Now SD Works hoped that other teams were chasing, would chase. They didn't. Movistar didn't chase. Jumbo Visma with Mariana Voss, they didn't chase. That gap went out exactly as I had told you guys on the butterfly effect of stage six. That could happen to Jonas Vinigo's team but didn't, but this is exactly what could happen. Nobody chased. That gap extended out to more than five minutes. Then it took a massive effort from Trek Segafredo to bring that gap within a somewhat closable distance. And then Lada Capecchi, the number one favorite, starting the Women's Perry roubaix edition, had to go to work and could not close the gap to give herself a shot at winning the Women's Perry roubaix edition. They lost Perry roubaix because they didn't take their number one favorite in the race close enough to give her 100% best odds of winning at Perry roubaix and they lost. And that's the exact same tactic that was being employed on stage six of the Basque Country and why I don't like putting my team under the faith of other teams to do the work if I know I'm the best rider in the race. If you're Jonas Vinigo on stage six of the Basque Country, you ride your team on the front, you get to 30 kilometers to go, then you just light everybody up and solo in. But you were under control of the race and what was happening in the race at the whole time with you and your teammates, not like SD Works, where you're just willing to gamble with some dice and roll them down the road that some other team like Movistar or Jumbo Visma would get on the front to pull that group back which they didn't, and the number one favorite in the women's Perry roubaix edition gave up a shot at winning, the, winning one of the biggest monuments of her career because she was willing to put the faith in other teams to work. Make sure you like and subscribe. I'll see you guys on the next edition of Beyond the Coverage sometime soon in the coming week.